Welcome back to Intro to Philosophy. My name is Tom, and in this unit, we are going to talk about David Hume and his epistemological position. Hume is a um, an empiricist, and um, he's also regarded as a skeptic. Um, in contrast to Descartes, um, who kind of uses a skeptical method to arrive at um, a kind of robust, uh, positive epistemological theory, a, a robust idea of what knowledge is. And, and he ends up saying that, you know, we actually have a lot of the knowledge we think we do. Um, Hume actually starts off at a very common sense uh, position and kind of teases out the commitments until he arrives at a skeptical conclusion. So Hume will think that we actually don't really know a lot of stuff we think we know. And um, it's what's really interesting about Hume is, is you really start off with very simple premises and you end up with a very radical conclusion. Um, so to start off, um, Hume is an empiricist and um, with Descartes, Descartes is a rationalist. Descartes thinks that um, basically what justifies our knowledge ultimately is our use of reason, right? Um, uh, he thinks that we have knowledge from the senses, that we see and hear things and have knowledge of objects in the external world, but he thinks we really need reason um, to help us interpret and know that what we think we see, we actually do see, right? Um, which is a pretty common sense position. You know, oftentimes we look and we think we see something, but we are able to supply what we see with certain context and other knowledge we have of the way the world works. And that's what helps us um, kind of uh, interpret what we see, okay? Now, um, in contrast, Hume is an empiricist. And so Hume thinks that really what we hear and see, what we experience directly is the foundation of what we know, right? Um, that's what justifies um, us having knowledge, um, not supplying that uh, our experiences with context provided by reason, right? He thinks actually our reasoning is built upon our experience. Um, so how does that work? Well, Hume starts off with very simple um, uh, uh, concepts here. He thinks, first he um, outlines what he thinks are immediate experiences, um, which he calls impressions, right? And that means like the, the way our senses, uh, the world kind of impresses itself upon us, right? Sometimes people think of the mind as like a wax tablet in the modern, um, philosophical world, right? And then the world just kind of like impinges on it like a stamp, right? Um, you look out and everything just kind of comes in, right? That's why they call them impressions. And for him, our immediate experience is what we see, what we hear, what we feel right now are impressions, right? Um, now, um, uh, in addition to this, he posits what we call, what he calls ideas. Um, ideas are copies of impressions, right? So, like memories or thoughts or concepts and so on and so forth. So, you know, I see a computer in front of me um, and based on that impression, I have a copy of it, right? And then maybe I go on and I see someone else in front of a computer and I have a, an impression of that and I copy that and then I kind of compare those copies and that's how I get the category of computer, right? This is the way, um, things work for Hume, right? Everything gets traced back to our immediate experience, okay? Now, um, in my notes, I mentioned that it is important to recognize how much we do this in terms of ideas, how much we um, uh, combine things in order to have uh, knowledge. So usually when we're talking about knowledge, we're talking about um, what we call propositional knowledge. So knowledge of propositions. So if you think you know facts, you know propositions or they have a propositional form usually. Um, meaning like I know that 
um, the cup is white. I know that um, the jacket is green, right? And it's a, an object with an attribute and it's put together. This is what makes like a complete sentence, right? You need um, an, an object and a, or a subject and a verb or adverb or whatever you need, right? You need to predicate something of um, the subject of the sentence, right? And that's how you get a sentence. So for Hume, that's all in the realm of ideas, right? Um, you're combining things, right? A color with an object, a shape with an object, um, uh, uh, sometimes, you know, a color with a color or whatever it is, right? You're combining things. Um, and notice also just objects that you see are combinations of various elements, right? So I give the example of a table. A table has like a top and four legs and has a certain color and so on and so forth. Um, so um, knowledge is always um, a combining or the way we typically think about knowledge is usually a combining of events, um, aspects of an object, um, uh, all kinds of things, right? But you put them together in a certain way. And if that combination matches up to the way the combination is in reality, then you have knowledge, right? Um, that's the way kind of like a thought works. Um, okay, so I just want to bracket that for a second and just kind of make you aware of how much um, combination plays into the way we think about the world. Okay, so for Hume, um, an idea is a good idea or constitutes knowledge if it can be traced back, if it's traceable back to impressions, right? So um, if I have the idea that, you know, the house across the street is green, um, then I have to be able to go walk across the street and look at it and be like, oh yeah, I can confirm it, right? Um, and this is the way we, um, uh, think about a lot of knowledge, right? If something's true, it's verifiable in a certain way, right? You have an idea, um, you think that, um, you know, uh, the car parked outside is black, you can walk outside and look at it, right? And we have all kinds, of, this is the way we tend to think about facts um, function, right? You have a thought about what is the case and then you go and you're able to test it, right? Um, okay, so um, this, is, this is it. This is all of Hume's framework, right? Um, so right now, this is when I usually ask students, like, if you're well, if you have any hesitancy, get off the train now, right? Um, because uh, Hume will tease this out into a um, pretty radical position. Um, so if you have this kind of strict empiricism, um, which sounds uh, pretty um, uh, promising to a lot of people, um, then, you know, first of all, you can disregard a lot of objects that we intuitively think are not real, right? So, um, like, we don't have knowledge of ghosts or angels or monsters or all these things. Why? Because we can't see them, we can't hear them, we can't verify that they're there. We can't go back and, and, and trace those ideas back to impressions, right? And for Hume, this is likely the, um, uh, the consequence of, you know, taking copies of impressions in our ideas and combining them in different ways um, that don't actually correspond back to um, actual impressions, right? Actual experiences, right? You take them, you put them together, kind of imagine them in a certain way, um, but they don't actually um, correspond to anything that you can really see or hear. Um, and so that seems um, like a pretty good consequence, right? But this, continues to go on. Um, so another object, um, I list three objects of philosophical importance that Hume thinks do not exist or that we don't have knowledge of um, because they don't exist. <laughs> we have no justification of thinking that they exist. And those are first God, right? And so, you know, someone who's um, inclined to think around uh, along atheistic lines might view this as a very promising um, uh, theory, right? So that, you know, the reason why um, God is not real for Hume is because you can't see God, you can't trace back to any impressions of God, right? Um, uh, and it's not verifiable in any way. Um, uh, there's no impressions of God. Now, 
one might think, oh, well, what if you hear a voice or, um, you know, you've read the Bible or you've talked to someone who told you something that is kind of like unexplainable or, or whatever, right? There are different ways in which people have spiritual experiences. And Hume would um, say, yes, you heard a voice. Yes, you um, talked to someone. Yes, someone told you something. Yes, you read a book. Um, none of that is an impression of God, right? Um, those are things that you take to be manifestations of God, but the thing that caused those things to happen, you never experienced, right? Um, so even there, you know, one might think, okay, this is a pretty good theory. Um, the second object here is the self. Um, Hume thinks we're not justified in believing that there is a self, uh, myself, yourself, any self, right? Um, uh, why is this? Well, um, okay, I'm talking into my computer. I can see myself right now. Right. Um, but what I see is a face, glasses, a shirt, um, a background. I hear things. Um, but what I don't see is the person or the mind or soul or whatever, the I behind that, um, that's supposed to be the cause of all the things that are going on. Right. Um, another way to think about this is that I tend to think that I am the same person that I was um, you know, 20 some odd years ago, right? Um, however, um, at that point in time, um, I looked different, I sounded different, I was a different shape, I was a different size, um, everything pretty much about me was different. Um, but how do I justify myself in thinking that I am the same person that I was back then? Um, Hume says, you're not, right? You're just, you're not just by and think that. Um, you tend to believe that, but you have no real justification for that because you have no impression of the I, the person, the self behind all that change, right? Um, so, and then even from a first person standpoint, you know, he still thinks, you know, all you have memories, you have images in your mind, you have thoughts, um, you have experiences, you have impressions, but you don't have an impression of the thing that's supposed to combine all those things, right? And hold them together so that they're all my memories, my thoughts, my experiences. He thinks the my, the thing that really holds that together, we don't have an experience of. So now, Hume's position looks a lot more radical, right? Um, this looks a little um, harder pill to swallow. And then the, the last um, real um, um, philosophical object of significance is causation. Um, Hume doesn't believe that we are justified in thinking of cause and effect. <laughs> um, so, um, he thinks uh, um, one example of this is, is like fire. We tend to think that fire causes heat. Um, Hume thinks, well, if we look at our impressions, we have an impression of light. Um, we have an impression of heat, a sensation of it, um, but we don't have a impression of the thing that's supposed to hold those things together, right? Um, we really don't have an impression of the connection between the heat and the and the light that we call fire, right? Um, and similarly, you know, a very famous example for Hume is that we we're not really justified in thinking the sun is going to rise tomorrow, right? Um, we have experiences that the sun has risen every day that I've lived, um, but from that, it does not follow that the sun will rise tomorrow. Right. Um, and even from like a kind of theoretical scientific point of view, we were really not justified in thinking that because we don't have an impression of the connection between those events and whatever natural laws that we think govern the fact that the sun will rise tomorrow. So, for example, um, you know, uh, gravity um, for Hume. Uh, we never have an impression of gravity. We have an impression of objects moving in various ways or objects doing things in, in various ways. Um, uh, but really we don't have an impression of any of the natural laws that we posit that are supposed to uh, explain and govern the way objects move. 
and manifest and change and alter, right? All kinds of natural laws, chemistry, physics, biology. He thinks we really don't have reasons to, to believe in these things. Um, uh, all we do is have impressions of things doing things. And that's really it. Um, and really, um, for Hume, um, at the end of the day, we really don't do not even have anything like mind independent objects. Um, as I mentioned before, when you when you see an object or notice an object, um, uh, it requires a combination of impressions for Hume. So, um, my old teacher would always um, talk about. Uh, an elephant, right? So imagine yourself walking around the elephant, you see the side of the elephant, then you walk in front, you see the face of the elephant, the trunk and everything. You walk to the other side, you see the other side of the elephant, you walk to the back, you see the back of the elephant, right? Its tail. Um, but you don't see the whole elephant ever. You always just have perspectives on it. And you take those perspectives, which for Hume are impressions, and you copy those impressions, right? And you put them together in a certain way until you say that this is an elephant. It's one and the same object that you're seeing from different perspectives. For Hume, you really don't have justification for thinking that. Um, uh, so yeah, Hume's position is, is pretty radical. I mean, he really thinks all we have is the here and now, and that's it. And there's something very appealing to that but it also ends up driving you to a place where you don't have um, the world you thought you did, right? And you don't have a lot of the knowledge you think you did, right? Um, so anyways, um, uh, I like human, it's, it's a lot of fun here, but um, it's just really important to try to understand how he kind of goes from this common sense position and kind of shows how we end up in a very kind of radical, um, skeptical position. So um, yeah, that's it for this unit and I will be talking with you soon.